Hello everybody, you welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. The Reggae genre is essentially music from the streets, by the streets, and for the streets. The traditional messages of that genre embody the realities of the struggle while preaching unity and motivating listeners to hold on for a brighter day and admonishing us all to show love to our fellow man. But in practice, none can compare to the impact and reach of Sugar My Not. Aside from being among the greatest philanthropists that Jamaica has ever seen, he was one of the architects of reggae as we know it today. While most reggae greats generally specialize in one of the sub-genres, Sugar My Not was a master of roots reggae, lovers rock and dance hall. Despite the brutal, fluid and often treacherous nature of the music industry, he was for four decades a shining beacon of all that is good, bright and beautiful about reggae music. Though an insanely gifted artist, he was always focused on bringing out the best in others and he made it his life's work to unleash the talents of Jamaican youth and keep them out of trouble by bringing as many as he could into the music business. He literally changed the lives of thousands of youths and made superstars out of hundreds of them. Now without further ado, let's take a look at the musical titan, the saint of Maxfield Park, the great Sugar Minot. His story began as Lincoln Barrington Minot on the 25th of May 1956 in Kingston, Jamaica to Austin and Lucy Minot. He earned the nickname Sugar due to his great loves for sweets and candy as a young boy. He grew up in Delacree Road in the tough neighborhood of Maxfield Park. By the 1960s, Kingston was literally exploding with musical energy and young Sugar wasn't left out of that revolution. His mother's house was right next door to a dance hall and the young lad took to it like an ant to, well, Sugar. He would become obsessed with music and gravitated to any place loudspeakers were booming and would often sneak into dance halls as he was too young to legally attend. He was enrolled in a trade school and started studying to become an electronic technician. But not long after, an encounter with a superstar turned his childhood obsession into a life path. He one day met dancehall legend Big Youth. Big Youth saw the desire and talent in Sugar and gifted the young boy a guitar. I can only imagine the excitement that young Sugar would have felt at that sort of gift from a superstar. The guitar cemented his desire to become a musician and he carried it every chance he got, singing and practicing chords in the streets after school. He was soon joined by his music-loving friends in the neighborhood, including one Tony Tuff. So one night, another teenager named Derek Howard was walking through the neighborhood and heard two boys jamming a sweet melody on the side of the road. He walked up and introduced himself to the pair of Sugar Minot and Tony Tuff and told them that he was interested in recording a song with them. They didn't believe him at first, but he insisted that he knew his way to making this happen. After rehearsing for about a week with these two boys, Derek took them to King Toby's studio and recorded the song Mystery of Nature for producer Rupi Edwards under the stage name The African Brothers. The African Brothers went on to record for a number of producers for a few years before auditioning for Studio One in 1974 and were taken on immediately by Coxon Dodd. The trio recorded only one song for Coxon Dodd's outfit before splitting up due to internal tensions. Though the group was now history, Sugar went back to Coxon Dodd and offered himself as a solo artist. He presented a game-changing idea that was irresistible to Coxon Dodd. Instead of creating new rhythms for his songs, he suggested singing over the already existing wonderful rhythms that Studio One had amassed over the years. This idea blew Coxon Dodd's mind as it was the studio's first foray into dance hall and that energy is what helped relaunch Studio One back into the reckoning. The studio's heyday had been the rocksteady era of the 1960s, but with the rise of reggae in the 1970s, other outfits had risen and had stolen the limelight. So with the crop of new artists like Freddie McGregor, Silver Tones and now Sugar Minot, Studio One was rebranded for a whole new generation. Sugar's first album for Coxon Dodd, titled Live Loving, came out in 1978 and brought a fresh sound to Jamaican music. Sugar Minot's style was something in between rich reggae and dancehall. The instrumentals were from old songs but were delivered with Sugar's cutting edge lyrics and style. He followed up with the album Showcase in 1979 and built on his first album success with fantastic songs like Vanity and Mr. DC. But as is often the story with Studio One artists, he was cranking out great, successful music but was still struggling financially. 
He had learned a lot from Coxon Dodd and Studio One had been something of a university. But after four wonderful years of learning, he moved on to do his own thing. Inspired by the likes of Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaacs, who had started their own record labels, he decided to go down that route. But instead of a business for himself alone, he got the vision for a collective enterprise that would be run entirely by young artists for young artists, with him then just 23 years old as the tip of the spear. This inspired him to set up the Black Roots recording label as a business and youth man promotions as a sort of charity or NGO. Even though he had left Studio One, there was no acrimony with Coxon Dodd as he was even then dating and even eventually married Coxon Dodd's niece, Maxine Stowe. Sugar was a born leader and had a genuine love for mankind and this would attract people to him in droves. After leaving Studio One, his base at Chisholm Avenue, still at Maxfield Park, became like a mecca for aspiring artists, ambitious youngsters and even homeless people. Sugar would accommodate and take care of everybody feeding, clothing, and even paying the tuition fees for many youth that he practically dragged to school. His plan was to nurture these youth's talent and have them release their music on Black Roots label. And thousands of youngsters showed up over the years. These included the likes of future greats like Tenosaur, Tony Rebel, Junior Reed, Daddy Freddy, Garnet Silk, and Yami Bolo. Sugar Minot was very versatile and didn't allow himself to be boxed into any particular style. He could do roots or dance hall. But by late 1979, he was inclined to lovers rock. At the same time, Jamaican music was dominated by spiritual, radical, Rastafarian themes. So he found it more difficult to grow the market for his kind of music. So he decided to follow the path of Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaacs again and went to the UK, which was at the time the biggest market in the world for lovers rock. He moved to the UK in late 1979 and by early 1980 had recorded a single aptly titled Lover's Rock, which became an instant hit in the UK, selling more than 20,000 copies. He quickly followed that up with the album titled Root Lovers in the same year, and in 1981 followed up with the smash album Good Thing Going. The album's title track Good Thing Going was the cover of a Jackson 5 song and became a roaring success as a single that went up to number 4 on the UK singles charts. He was flourishing in the UK, but his commitment to his vision back home caused him to return to Jamaica to personally supervise the Youth Man promotion in 1983. He marked his return with a sensational performance at that year's edition of the Reggae Sun Splash at Montego Bay. But upon his return, he found that all was not well with Youth Man promotions and Black Roots. He had been sending money home to maintain and take care of the artists through an assistant named Jimmy Brown. But Jimmy was keeping all the money to himself and leaving the boys hungry and growingly frustrated. This led to many of the artists being forced to leave, with many of them joining rival outfits. This weakened the vision immeasurably, but Sugar did what he could to patch what was left of the movement and kept on his mission. By the time he had returned from the UK, the dancehall revolution had swept through Jamaica like a hurricane, but Sugar being no slouch jumped into the fray in 1984 with a trio of albums and a string of hit singles that blew up the Jamaican charts. But by the end of the 1980s, the Black Roots label had all but folded and Sugar's dominance had started to fade. Despite releasing music regularly, it wasn't possible to manage his own huge career and at the same time personally carry the huge load of his pet projects. As the 90s unfolded, the same fate that befell the label would also hit the Youth Man promotions. Dance Hall in Jamaica had moved from the ragamuffin sound to a more aggressive style loaded with slack content of violence and sex. And most importantly, Jamaican music had leaned heavily towards hip-hop. Sugar simply refused to adopt to that style and was unable to win over new generations of Jamaican fans. What finally spelled the end of youth man promotions was a law that came to light in Jamaica in 1997 called the Noise Abatement Act which heavily curtailed and regulated outdoor events. And this law almost single-handedly buried the outdoor dance hall culture of Jamaica. But despite these challenges, Sugar Minot continued on his grind, releasing material every now and then and was in heavy demand for concerts and tours around the world into the 2000s. But in 2009, he was diagnosed with a heart condition but continued to tour and work as usual. But in early 2010, he was forced to cancel a string of concerts in Canada due to ill health and severe chest pains. 
A few months later, he was scheduled to perform a series of shows in California when he passed on suddenly on the 10th of July 2010 of a heart attack. It was a sudden and sad end to the life of one of the most beloved figures in Jamaican music. Sugar My Not left an amazing catalogue of wonderful music as well as a legacy of love and service to humanity. Despite his immense success, he never left the ghetto but tried his best to turn the ghetto around from within. He genuinely did his best to make the world a better place and even when he couldn't, he still managed to build and sustain a fortress and world of his own as a shining example of how the world was supposed to live and he stuck to his ideals up until the very end. Sugar Mine Not, in my opinion, was not only among the most remarkable artists of all time but also a wonderful human being who more than anybody in recent times deserves the title of a saint. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, Jobless.